afternoon. Firstly, a big thank you to all of those who are joining me this afternoon for this joint webinar hosted by BDO and Bracewell. Uh, by way of introduction, I'm Chris Williams, Managing Partner of Bracewell's Dubai office. I'll be joined today by my colleague, Adam Lutaro, Senior Associate in our Dubai office, and by our friends and colleagues at BDO, Brian Conn, a partner in the firm's tax services department, and Verona Ho, an Associate Director, again in BDO's Dubai Tax Advisory Services Department. The purpose of today's webinar is to discuss the impact of the economic substance regulations and the related notification processes that may affect your business. Bracewell and BDO have joined together to present this webinar on the basis that the topic requires a holistic legal and tax approach. To start with, Brian will provide us with an introduction to the economic substance regulations. This will be followed by Ade, who will comment on meeting the economic substance test uh, from a corporate governance perspective and some thoughts in related to corporate governance matters. After this, Verona will chat us through some further specific points, uh, mainly relating to holding companies and IP matters, again regarding economic substance tests and the consequences of non compliance. We will then follow our presentations with a QA. And as such, I would kindly ask that you have any questions uh, left until that point in time, albeit there is, I think, in front of you, a ability to type in any questions that you may have that, uh, as we go along. Um, the economic substance regulations are important. Businesses undertaking relevant activities need not just comply with their notification obligations, but also walk the walk and talk the talk when it comes to meeting the underlying substance obligations, something our speakers would no doubt emphasize. With that, over to Brian. Thank you, Chris. And um, I'd like to say, firstly, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be able to uh, share the stage, as it were, with, with Bracewell. Um, it's, it's great to do a, a joint presentation. So thank you very much. Um, if we uh, move on to the um, first slide, um, just brief agenda. Um, Chris has really gone through all of this. Um, we will give you the, the background. We'll give you a chance to ask some questions at the end. So, just uh, as real background, uh, uh, you know, the reason as to why. ESR was introduced in the UAE in the first place. Um, it, it's in support of work done by various global organizations, in particular the OECD, to combat international tax avoidance. And um, the essence of um, the ESR is simply that if you put a, a, an entity in a jurisdiction, it should have sufficient people, assets, expenditure in that jurisdiction to operate the business. Now, the ESR is in the UAE governed at the highest level by the Ministry of Finance, um, but that, that uh, role has been passed down, the reporting role has been passed down to the individual licensing authorities. So the, the various um, bodies that issue trade licenses in the UAE are the ones that will administer the ESR on a daily basis and will gather in the reports and all of the information. So let's um, move on, if we may, to the, the next slide. So who does the ESR apply to? ESR applies to any licensee that carries out a relevant activity in the UAE. So to start with there, we have two pieces of jargon to define. Licensee, uh, first of all, just means any business that has a trade license in the UAE. The law refers to licensees. So you'll hear us talking about licensees quite a bit during the um, presentations today. Uh, but it, um, it, any sort of body, uh, onshore, offshore, free zone, mainland company, branches of foreign companies, anybody who has a trade license is potentially within the scope of the ESR. Now the second point, the relevant activity, we'll look at in a minute. Um, there are a couple of exemptions that it's worth mentioning. Uh, the main exemption is, is for licensees that are owned by government bodies. Um, 
either government at a, an emirate or a federal level. Um, there's also a sort of exemption for um, businesses that are not generating any income during a relevant year. Um, effectively, they fall out of having to do the full reporting. So, relevant activities. Um, as I said, it is only licensees who carry out a relevant activity um, that falls within the, the full scope of the ESR. Now, there's nine of these relevant activities. And as you will see from the slide, these are general um, broad business headings. So banking, insurance, fund management, lease finance, headquarters, shipping, intellectual property, holding companies, distribution and service centres. Now, although they're broad headings, um, the, the law for each of those headings defines something fairly specific. So, um, you know, for example, within distribution companies, um, it is only a distribution business that um, purchases goods from a connected party overseas, imports those goods into UAE and then export some of them again. So it, it is quite specific, but they're broad headings. So if you're falling into those broad headings, then you need to consider um, whether or not you're actually going to be in the scope. It's worth saying that the approach taken in taken here is very much substance over form. It's, uh, it's, um, it's about what the business actually does. So you can't just look at the trade license and check whether the trade license description of the business is the same as one of these headings. You actually have to look at the business itself and say, what are we doing? Now, there's quite a lot of good guidance, by the way, on the uh, Ministry of Finance website. Uh, Ministry of Finance has done quite a good job um, getting information out there, and particularly around what it considers falls into these headings. Right, now, Assuming um, you're carrying out a relevant activity, there are three tests to meet, and I will hand over to Ade, who will take us forward, and we'll look at these three tests um, one by one. Thank you. Ade. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, as Brian has mentioned, I will now take us through the three substance tests uh, applied by the regulation, which need to be met um, if a licensee derives its income um, from a relevant activity. Uh, the first is the core income generating activity must be carried out from the UAE. Uh, the second is the licensee must be directed and managed in the UAE. Uh, and lastly, there must be adequate employees, physical assets and expenditure in the UAE. I will go through and discuss each in turn, uh, starting with core income generating activities. Core income generating activity is a term that's specifically been coined in the regulation, um, and it is defined as those activities which are of central importance to the licensee um, in which income is generated from the relevant activity. Uh, the, reg the regulation is given an illustrative list, which is non-exhaustive, but for example, with a distribution and service center um, business, a core income generating activity uh, may include transporting and storing parts and materials, uh, managing inventories, taking orders, and providing consulting or other administrative uh, services. The next test is directed and managed in the UAE. Um, whilst there are three different substance, substantive tests, um, in our view, this is perhaps the most important and the test which will have most scrutiny and the authorities will look most closely at in terms of uh, the three substance tests. Um, and under this test, um, licensees are required to demonstrate that the relevant activity um, as described by Brian earlier on, is directed and managed from the UAE. Um, and there are a number of ways 
um, this test can be de demonstrated and shown in practice, um, such as the holding of board meetings um, in the UAE, um, ensuring that um, an adequate number of directors are actually uh, physically present um, in the UAE, um, directors having the necessary knowledge and expertise to discharge the duty of the board, um, and essentially what the authorities will be looking at is to see whether there is sufficient evidence to show that in substance um, the business is actually directed um, and managed uh, in the UAE. Um, like I said, of the three, uh, this is perhaps the most uh, crucial um, and what will have most scrutiny um, in terms of the authorities' perspective. The third is the company must prove that it has um, adequate resources in the UAE. Um, and by that, what we mean by is having an adequate number of qualified full-time employees um, based in the UAE uh, for execution of the core income generating activities, um, having an adequate um, operating expenditure in the UAE for carrying out the relevant activity um, and having an adequate level of fiscal assets in the UAE. Um, the regulation does not uh, stipulate um, exactly what would be determined as an adequate number um, with regards to each of uh, these, these headings I've, I've, I've mentioned, employees, expenditure and fiscal asset, uh, but it will depend on the type of relevant activity and the type of business um, that is being conducted. Um, so that will differ from business to business depending on um, the relevant activity and the core income generating um, activity in question. I'll now hand over to Verona to discuss meeting the tests for outsourcing um, arrangements. Thank you, Adi. So, Adi has taken you through all the tests that you need to require, particularly um, having adequate resources. So, the legislation, um, the intention of the legislation isn't for all companies to hire um, and to hire the um, sufficient amount of people um, to meet this uh, test. They do acknowledge that in a global economy, or at least in most businesses nowadays, a substantial amount of activities are outsourced, and therefore they do provide provisions within the law uh, that allows um, to account for these outsourced activities as part of your substance. It's important to know that uh, if you do outsource, there are certain conditions that you need to fulfill, um, and those conditions are listed on the slide there. The first uh, condition that you need to ensure is that the outsource activity must be conducted in the UAE, which means that your outsource service provider should have adequate activities, employees, expenditure and premises from the UAE. So if you do outsource a significant amount of your activities or key activities of your relevant activities outside of the UAE, it may be something that you need to visit. And the other condition is uh, also very important. You need to demonstrate that you have adequate supervision and control of these activities that you do. The last point is also very important where uh, it does specify that there's no double counting. Uh, it's a bit of a technical jargon and what they mean by double counting is that, for example, if your outsource service provider services more than one company and they have a total of five staff, they do not want each of their customers to account for the five employees as part of their resources and substance in the UAE. The outsource service provider will need to tell you how much time these employees spend on their work and you will have to provide um, the details of those employees within your substance. So it might not be five, it might be 1.5, or maybe even, you know, a, it might not even be a full employee, but effectively they, um, there is no double counting allowed. So the outsource service providers will need to provide you uh, such information. So we have talked about the substance test uh, in the earlier slides. 
uh, I'm going to cover two specific um, relevant activities which has a bit of a different uh, rules or different conditions for substance requirements. Oh, apologies for that. I got the slide wrong. Adi, um, I believe this is your slide, corporate governance. Thanks, Verona. Um, yes, yeah, so just talking about the practical implications um, of corporate governance um, and the operating model, just to follow on from the uh, three tests that I mentioned. Um, and to start with corporate governance, that links to um, the control and governance, as we spoke about previously, um, in terms of how a board meeting is conducted um, and how board meetings recorded. Um, in order to demonstrate that the standard um, in the uh, regulation, um, regulation is met, um, it would need to be shown that board meetings are conducted in the UAE, um, relevant meetings, board meetings are recorded um, appropriately to show that control um, actually occurs and the um, entity is being governed out of the um, UAE. So there are a number of questions that um, I would like to pose um, for us to think about at this stage in terms of corporate governance. Um, firstly, like I mentioned, you know, are all board meetings held in person in the UAE? Um, secondly, how many board meetings in total uh, were held uh, in the UAE? Um, how frequent um, are such board meetings held in the UAE each year? Um, are there enough directors present um, for all board meetings in the UAE to be correct? Um, and are strategic decisions, what type of decisions um, are being made at the board meetings which are being held um, in the UAE? These are all questions that um, would need to be considered in terms of looking at the corporate governance of a licensee to be able to identify whether um, this substance test um, is met. Um, and in terms of um, operating models, like we said previously, um, this will differ from uh, business to business um, and depending on the type of relevant activity and core income generating activity that is being conducted. Um, but as we mentioned, um, the authorities will look at the uh, number of employees, um, whether any outsourcing structures are put in place and are in place, um, and the substance um, of those arrangements, um, how much uh, expenditure is being incurred vis-a-vis um, -vis the uh, income that is being generated um, in the UAE. Is it true um, expenditure that links to the core generating, core income generating activity? Um, and how many physical assets um, are located um, in, the, in the UAE? Thank you, Adi. So coming from the test and the corporate governance um, that we have discussed earlier, I now come to the special conditions that we have for two specific um, relevant activities. The first is a holding company. A holding company is effectively a company um, that only does one thing, holding equity interest and der deriving income from that equity interest through dividends of capital gains. It does not carry out any other commercial activity. If it does, say, for example, the holding company provides an intercompany loan and uh, derives interest from that, you are no longer a holding company and these special conditions do not apply. If you are a holding company, it is good news. It means that there are reduced substance requirements because um, the law acknowledges that if you're only a holding company, it's unlikely that you will need substantial resources um, to perform your activities. So the reduced requirements are that you need to comply with the requirements um, set out by your regulatory authority. So file the documents that you need to file on time, ensure that you, um, you are fully compliant with whatever's required um, based on your licensing requirements. And you need to ensure adequate employees and premises. They do provide some uh, wiggle room in terms of what they consider adequate employees and premises for a holding company. 
directors can be considered as an employee for a holding company. And you could even consider registered officers or agents, flexi desk arrangements as your premises in UAE. So coming from a holding company which has uh, a reduced substance requirements, we now um, arrive at IP business, which is quite unique. Um, and it's very important for you to know because um, IP business in itself isn't considered high risk, but there's something uh, that comes off an IP business, which is a high risk IP business, uh, which has substantial implications if you do perform a high risk IP business. So what uh, does the law consider an IP business? Is anyone who holds, exploits, or receives income from intellectual property assets. So long as you hold an intellectual property asset, it doesn't matter if it's registered or recognized on your books of account. Um, there's no, um, well, it's not limited to any uh, IP assets which is registered, which is a, a common question that we get all the time. So long as you hold or export or receive income, you are considered an IP business. And if you are, the next thing that you need to consider is, are you a high risk? If you're a high risk IP business, uh, it means that you did not create the IP that you currently hold. You acquired it from a group company or in consideration for funding research and development in a foreign jurisdiction outside of UAE. And you receive income from group companies in connection with this asset that you hold. If you do consider yourself a high-risk IP business, what it means to be one is that the law automatically deems that you have failed the standard economic substance test that we have discussed earlier. It, the regulatory authority, so your licensing authority and MOF, is required to share information with foreign tax jurisdictions. And you will need to meet this additional test um, to ensure that you meet the substance requirements. If you are unable to meet this additional test, you have considered that you have failed your substance test in UAE. So these additional tests are effectively proving historically you had a high degree of control on the development and hustle and maintenance protection and exploitation of this IP. This will be based on historical information, so what has been done in the past. You need to prove um, why you are holding this IP in the UAE. So a proper business plan to substantiate why is this IP held in UAE and nowhere else? And detailed employee information of anyone who was involved in the development, exploitation, maintenance and protection of this IP. So coming from the test, uh, the next question I'm sure you all have is, what are we supposed to follow when, um, where, so the, there are two reports that are required to be filed by all licensees in the UAE. The first that we'll talk about is an ESR notification, which I'm sure that you have heard that a lot of jurisdictions are calling for this right now. This will be an annual notification that all licensees will need to file with their regulatory authority to provide information on whether they have done a relevant activity within the financial year. If they do do a relevant activity or met more than one relevant activities, they will need to provide information on what kind of income that they have received from this activity and whether it was taxed in any other jurisdiction outside of UAE. You will also need to provide financial year information because as I mentioned earlier, this will be an annual notification which would be based on your financial years. The most deadlines for this notification has been uh, indicated as 30th of June by most authorities, but there are quite a number of different uh, timelines um, given by different authorities, some 12th June, some 25th June. We have slides later which will provide you a list of all that has been announced thus far. So moving on from notification, what happens after? You're notified the authorities that you do a relevant activity. Um, the next step that you need to do is file an ESR report. An ESR report is due 12 months from the end of each financial year, which means if your year end is 31st December 2019, the deadline for the filing of an ESR report for that financial year is 31st December 2020. Templates of this report has not been released by any authority thus yet, but this report, the report is expected um, 
for you to confirm whether or not you have met the ESR test for that financial year um, and provide evidence and information uh, proving uh, whether or not you have met the test. So these are the two uh, documents and reports that you will need to file every single year. Um, again, to emphasize the report will only be required if you did a relevant activity and has derived income uh, for that financial year in relation to that relevant activity. If you have not performed a relevant activity, then only the ESR notification will be required. So this slide uh, basically provides you a summary of penalties, which is a very important topic because the penalties are quite severe, which shows um, the importance the authorities are placing um, in getting ESR correct in this jurisdiction. The first um, penalty that I'm going to talk about is the failure to submit the ESR notification, uh, which you will face a potential penalty of 10,000 to 50,000. If you fail to provide accurate or complete information, both in the ESR notification or report, you're looking at a potential penalty of 10 to 50,000 and also a deep failure to demonstrate economic substance in the UAE. So you have them to fail the test. If you continue to fail the ESR test, um, or if you have failed the test, you are looking at a potential penalty of 10 to 50,000 in the first year. And they will also need to exchange your information with foreign authorities, which um, the information will be shared uh, with regards to the parents' company's names, ultimate parent company, and UPOs. The penalties get more severe in the second year onwards. Um, if you continue to fail the test in the second consecutive year, information exchange will still happen, but you will see that the penalties have gone up from 10 to 50,000 to 50 to 300,000. And you could also face um, a suspension or withdrawal of your commercial license. So on this slide and the slide after, you will see that we have summarized uh, the deadlines that has been confirmed by the regulatory authorities. Some of it has passed, for example, DAFSA, um, the IFC, you will see that all of these um, deadlines have already passed. Um, they are, if you have not submitted notifications, we need to emphasize that you need to submit them immediately. The rest, most of them, you will see is 30th of June. Um, we expect that those that we are waiting confirmation on to be 30th of June as well. Um, but we will need to, this to be confirmed by the regulatory authorities. So that covers our presentation. Uh, we now are, are proceeding to the Q&A section. As Brian mentioned earlier, at, or Chris mentioned earlier, if you want to ask a question, you have two avenues. You can type your question in the Q&A box, which our facilitator, Nishi, uh, will pick and choose some to read out. The alternative is to also raise your hand and she will unmute your speaker or your mic um, for you to ask your question live. Thanks, Verona. Uh, we have uh, quite a number of questions. So I am now proceeding on to uh, Mr. Arindam Chakrabarti. He has a question. So Arindam, we are uh, unmuting you right now. You can have, uh, you can ask your question live. Hi, I just wanted to check uh, uh, for offshore companies because there is no trade license uh, so basically they are not doing any activities onshore with uh, you know with, with uae companies so is it also mandatory for offshore companies to be subject to the csr regulations and secondly I, in dubai sorry. most of the offshore companies have to be in existence through an agent you know you may have a office, but you still have to appoint your an agent like BDO or whoever who can be the agent. So is it true that you have to uh, go through this exercise through your agent and uh, why? That's it. Okay, okay. Um, take, taking the first question there, um, as an offshore company, um, you, you do still need to make a, a notification um to to the um 
the the authority that you're registered with. Um, so you, you do need to make the, the notification. Um, if you're not um, making, uh, if you don't have any income within uh, UAE, which as you say as an offshore company um, should be the case, um, then it will just simply be a notification that you are not make, uh, do not carry out any relevant activities. Um, uh, as to, to, to making the notification itself, I think lots of people will do it through their agent, um, uh, but I don't think there's any reason why you shouldn't be able to do it yourself. I don't know if any of the other panelists um, want to come in on that. Um, yeah, I believe if they are registered, uh, offshore companies who are registered through a registered agent, the notification will have to be done by the agent itself. So uh, we would suggest that you get in touch with your registered agent uh, to get this filing done because they will get the instructions from the regulatory authority on where and how to submit the notification. Okay, right. thank okay. you so thank much. You. Okay, thank you for the question. Right, so up next we have Ms. Amrita Michael. So I'm just unmuting Amrita. Hi, I'm Rita. I believe there's some technical glitch. Let me read out the question for you. So she says that does the activity of brokerage or trading as a principal come under the investment fund activity? Do you want to pick that up, Rona or Ade? I'm uh, happy, happy to pick that up. Um, I think depending on exactly what um, occurs within your specific business, um, it, it, will dif it will be difficult to give a simple yes or no um, answer. The uh, regulations give some explanation, quite a detailed explanation as to what falls under the investment fund, the banking, the investment fund management um, uh, relevant activity. So we would need to um, engage uh, a bit more with what type of activities and um, uh, what type of business you actually conduct to be able to give you a yes or no um, uh, complete answer I, I think just as a as a follow-up to that as well and it goes back to brian's point earlier on is that this is why it's important not to just be looking at simply what your trade license says you know it's important to actually look at what actual activities you're undertaking in in country because obviously you know <laughs> trade licenses can sometimes hide a multitude of sins in terms of what you're actually licensed to do and what you're actually doing in practice and part of this economic substance regulation is really to flush out a lot of these sorts of issues and obviously to flush out a lot of issues where companies are obviously engaged in business in the Emirates who are not properly uh, undertaking their corporate governance uh, obligations uh, typically are being managed from overseas. So, you know, I think that this is something whereby, you know, and I know it sounds very self-serving for lawyers and accountants to be telling you this, but this is why you do really need, I think, some professional advice in terms of actually going through this process, in terms of actually doing a proper deep dive, in terms of actually what you're doing, rather than just relying upon, well, you know, my trade license says that I'm not doing that, so therefore I'm not privy to that particular regulation. And, and, and just to add to what Chris said, um, it's, it's important to bear in mind that there, there, there are essentially two subsets um, of analysis that needs to occur. Um, the first being, is there a relevant activity? Um, and then the second um, analysis of the core income generating um, activity um, within um, uh, that relevant activity. So it's, it's difficult to, without having you know um, more information to give you a yes or no uh, answer and I, I think just to say it's it's the financial services areas are the most difficult i think from that point of view to to give a, a fairly simple answer to right nishi um yeah. do we have another question yes we do have another question from clara her question is 
what will be shared with foreign tax authorities and what is the consequence of sharing this information? Well, uh, there's, there's, there's certain details that, that, that might be shared um, in certain circumstances um, regarding the, the ultimate parent company. Um, the, in terms of the, the consequences, um, time will tell, but, but ultimately there is a risk that if businesses are seen to be failing um, economic substance tests in a particular jurisdiction, um, that there might be a loss of um, tax treaty benefits um, between the two countries. So the, the, the whole thrust of what the, the OECD has been trying to do uh, to combat tax avoidance has been around transparency. So this sharing of information between tax authorities is very much part of um, that, um, that, that general thrust. Right. I hope that answers her question. We now move on to Mr. Suraj Ratan. I will now unmute Suraj so that he can just ask his uh, question. Suraj, can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I have a few questions. Hi. Uh, actually, my question is like, uh, we have a DMCC registered company. I want to ask whether the, the DFC registered company, uh, the manager of the DFC company is uh, preparing books and uh, keeping their uh, everything bank statement in the, of the VVI company. And uh, the DMCC company is charging to those VVI companies. And the director of those VVI company is a manager of the DMCC company. So how does it affect ESR? So do we have to comply with any of the ESR? I'm I'm happy to. Yeah, yeah. Please, please dive I'm, in. I'm happy. To, I'm happy to give a, a, an initial response on this. Um, so just to take it from the top, um, just to reiterate, um, every company, every entity uh, that is licensed in the UAE, including your company, which is a DMCC company, uh, needs to file a notification, um, and. In filing that notification, there needs to be an assessment internally on whether um, you comply with um, and need to comply with economic substance uh, regulations. And as we went through um, previously, the first is, are you conducting a relevant um, activity? Uh, you mentioned that there are certain um, services that are being provided for, um, I think you mentioned a BVI company, yeah, um, yeah. Yes. and that might be a related um, entity. Um, so, you know, off the top of my head, um, it sounds very similar to what the authorities describe as a, a distribution and services um, uh, company in terms of the relevant activity um, with it being services being provided to um, a foreign um, entity that is linked to the DMCC company. Um, but like we said, it would be very difficult to give you a yes or no answer, although um, at this point, you know, based on the information you have given, it sounds a lot like um, uh, a services company. Um, and then the next step would be to do an assessment of, you know, the core income generating activities um, and whether they, um, the other three tests um, are, are, are met. But the, the, the starting point is a notification does need to be filed. And in doing so, you would need to consider whether you are conducting a relevant activity and whether the uh, other two limbs, well, the other three uh, substance tests um, are met. Who will be doing the substance test? Who will be doing substance test? Uh, who will be doing the test? Uh, it, the, no. the test is, um, the, the test is, it's a self-assessing um, um, uh, test. So uh, you need to consider it for yourself. You need to, to um, be able to answer the question on, on the form, do you meet the tests? Um, so um, it won't be assessed by a, a, a third party, at least not in the, the first place. Um, it is very much a, a self-assessing measure. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Okay, so, thank you, Suraj. Yeah, thank, um, thank you. Question. Please Sorry, shoot. Brian. Just, 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 just very quickly, just in relation to that last question. You know, sort of yeah. gen, general, general thoughts in relation to that. One is that, you know, I think this shows the the importance of of having these things reviewed and speaking to your professional advisors regarding regarding these filings. And I think the other the other thing that's particularly important, particularly given that obviously this is the first time that everybody's going through this, is to ensure that certainly in the first instances that you know, a, a slightly more conservative view is taken in relation to uh, the test. And, and part of that is because obviously, as Verona explained, then there are some relatively stringent fines and penalties that are in place here for non-compliance. And, you know, certainly my, my view of the world for what it's worth is that I think you will actually see some of these, um, some of these fines actually properly imposed. And part of the reason for that is because it's incredibly important for the UAE to show compliance with with this system you know everybody will probably be familiar with the fact that you know this is a system that has come into place as a consequence of the uae previously being on something of a naughty step for non-compliance with with international regulations so you know i think that it is incredibly important for everybody to take this incredibly seriously um, and also as part of that you know not just look at the actual notification process but really do a deep dive in terms of you know understanding and recognizing whether or not there are any actual defects in terms of how you go about doing business in in, in country yeah i think um as you say this is actually a measure that is very very important to the uae uh, and i have absolutely no doubt um that those those fines will be imposed um exactly according to the law um, so it is very important that people take everything seriously and, and make sure they notify, make sure they report in, in the right way. Right, Nishi, um, next question. Yeah, we have uh, quite a number of questions around the uh, COVID crisis. So has the authority uh, announced any relief under ESR in light of COVID? Um, the, the, the Ministry of Finance has, has made um, some comments around the COVID crisis. Um, bear in mind that the notifications that are being made at the moment um, are for years commencing 1st of January 2019, uh, and therefore most will be ending uh, before uh, COVID hit. Um, the Ministry of Finance has, has made some comments I believe around, um, for example, um, board meetings, if you can't get um, um, board meetings together that would have taken place. Um, so, so there is um, some recognition that um, things are perhaps not quite as straightforward as, as normal, uh, but I think in most cases, because of the timing, that will be more relevant to um, next year's tests um, than this year. Um, I don't know if anybody else has got any um, comments or heard anything else about reliefs for COVID. Just, just to add to that, Brian, we um, actually uh, got in touch with uh, DIFC um, and DAFSA to ask about this um, particular question because we had a number of uh, clients who were finding it difficult to actually complete the notification in time um, as a result of COVID-19 related issues. Um, and the response that both authorities gave was that they had not given a blanket exemption um, or changed the deadline as a result of COVID-19. Um, however, should there be any specific difficulties um, that the relevant company should write to them and inform them that you know they are trying to um, complete this notification uh, within the deadline, however, would require X amount of um, additional time uh, to be able to comply with that um, as a result of um, uh, COVID-19. COVID Thanks. That's, 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 that's quite useful. I think the, the, the message is if there are any issues that you're facing um, to get in touch with your authority, um, and, and explain what's going on. Communication always the best way. Right, uh, Nishi, uh, do we have another question? Yeah, 
Yeah, we do. Uh, so we have another question from uh, Miss Tina Kalia. Can you hear us, Tina? Hi, Tina. Are you uh, able to? Hi. Are you able to hear Hi. me? Hi. Yeah. We can hear um, you. Good afternoon, uh, firstly, to everyone. And thank you for uh, having such a lovely session for us. Um, actually, we belong to the insurance uh, brokerage industry. And uh, as per the guidelines issued, we have been informed that uh, brokerage services do not fall under the purview of the regulation. I wanted to confirm this. And then secondly, we are regulated by the insurance authority. So our question is, do we have to report to the insurance authority or to the economic department? And okay. uh, do we have to give a negative notification um, because of the fact that it's not applicable to us as per the uh, DED guidelines? Okay. So, Rona, do you want to jump in? I think you're muted, Verona. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> so um, I'll just take the question in stages. Um, the first question was whether or not um, you fall under the insurance relevant activity. And I agree with you. If you have gone through the guidance issued by the MOF, they do exclude brokerage, um, insurance brokerage from the insurance relevant activity. Uh, so yes, you you know, if that's all you do, um, you sh ESR shouldn't apply. Um, and yes, you will need to file a negative notification. We are aware that there's quite a lot of different information in the market. Some authorities say if you don't do a relevant activity, you don't need to file. And there are others that say that you need to file whether or not you need to you do a relevant activity and file a negative notification. Our personal advice is to still file it um, because of the ambiguity in the market. It shows the authority that you have considered it for your business. Uh, and therefore you're telling them that no, this doesn't apply to me and therefore we do not do any relevant activity and ESR won't apply. Um, on which authority that you need to file, uh, at the current moment, it's still not very clear. Have you received um, any memos um, or circulars from both authorities or just uh, the DED itself? Uh, it's just from the DED uh, for the time being, nothing from the insurance authority so far, although there are rumors saying that they will issue their own guidelines. Yeah, um, I would say file it with the DED for the meantime, but if you do keep an eye out for the um, one from the insurance um, regulators, and if they require you, you just need to file the same thing. The format should be pretty similar to what you filed with the DED. Oh, okay. And would it be required for us to give a notification for every year or is it just a one-time thing? It's every year because businesses will change, your activities may change in the future. So for each year, you need to file a notification and if it applies to you, you need to file an annual report. So it's an annual activity. Okay, so we, um, we are registered with DED. So they do have a link on their website where we have to... Um, fill out a notification form, I think through Google Docs. So over there, when, when we tried it, um, although we did not submit it yet, I can see that they're only referring to 2020 as a financial year, and we are not able to edit it to 2019. So do we have to give them a separate notification or send in an email or anything for this? There should be a financial year option for you to fill up. Uh, you're saying that's not available. That's right, because it's a Google uh, form designed especially for a particular year. And I'm not able to change the years over there. And for the time being, it's only 2020 that I could see. Okay, that's interesting. There's no separate column for financial year uh, in that form. Mm -hmm. No. Okay, uh, sorry for the confusion. The reason why um, I'm asking these questions is that we have seen the form and previously it was editable, but they have been making changes to the form. Adi, do, mm -hmm. you, um, do you have any inputs on this? Um, I agree with you, Verona. Uh, the forms that we've seen, um, it was uh, it was possible to edit the relevant financial year, um, and especially noting that the current deadline is 
supposed to be um, in respect to the previous financial year, um, not 2020. Um, what I would recommend um, again is, you know, um, engage with your professional advisors and see if you can write to the DED um, separately, put some sort of cover note um, in your um, submission to, to clarify this point. Um, but the forms that we've seen, um, you've been able to uh, edit that. Because so far we've been only able to edit the month and the and the date, not the year. So that was one clarification I needed. That's all. all right. Yeah. Thank you so much. No okay. Problem. Thank you, Tina. Interesting questions there, actually. Thank you. Okay. Um, Nishi, we've probably got time for maybe one or two more questions. Yeah. Uh, we have another question from Michael. His question is around high-risk IP. So is developing software a high-risk IP business? Uh, de developing software itself is, is not a, a high-risk um, IP business. It's, a quite, it's quite possible that um, in doing that, you will um, end up developing, um, of course, some intellectual property, um, which um, uh, you may own and exploit in the future but the the actual um developing of the um of the software in the first place um isn't high risk ip and of course if it's if it's being developed here um then of course it's never going to fall into that that high risk category high risk is where um essentially you've you've bought in the the um ip from from outside the country i mean interestingly um, in the long run, um, these rules, which are very stringent around high-risk um, intellectual property, uh, may be, actually be a benefit to the, um, the the economy of the UAE because actually this is somewhere where you can the the, the resources, the infrastructure is here to develop um, IP, which might not be the case in in some other parts of the world uh, where where IP is commonly housed. Um, but short answer to the question is that um, developing software won't in itself be a, uh, a high-risk IP business. Well, that's interesting. Uh, just in continuation to that question, do you um, do you have a, a, we do? Can we take another question because it's slightly related to this topic of uh, IP? Uh, we certainly can. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we have next question from Ankit Kasat. I'll just unmute him. Uh, Ankit, can you hear us? Hello. Hello, Ankit. Yes, uh, nice, nice, yeah, nice to hear from good you. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. It was an interesting uh, webinar. Uh, my question is on the IP that is there any uh, threshold on the IP revenue? Like if the IP revenue, let's say, is uh, less than 1% of the total revenue, still it's fall under the relevant activities? There's, there's actually no, no thresholds um, in these regulations at all. So um, just, just one dirham of, of income potentially um, creates um, income that could be seen um, as a relevant activity. Um, so so answer to that is is no. It's an interesting point. I mean, at some some point in the future, um, there may be introduction of some sort of um, minimum thresholds or de minimis le levels, but uh, we don't have them at the moment. Um, do you do you have IP assets? Yes. Uh, and are they they assets which you're you're actually earning income directly from? Correct, but it is not a relevant like let's say it is less than a one percent of the total revenue mm. Mm. yes i'd still still potentially though it is um in itself uh uh, uh an ip business okay okay uh thank you for the question though it's uh it's an interesting interesting question Right. Um, I, I think we probably could just squeeze one more quick question in if there's anybody still waiting, Nishi. 
Uh, yeah, we do have another question from uh, Miss LV. LV, you can now ask Hi, uh, good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, it's just a quick good question. Um, actually, uh, we are a branch of foreign company. And um, our um, our services is uh, we do receiving equipment of satellite and broadband and installation. Are we um, going uh, to do this uh, ESR as well? Do we need to do this? Um, I couldn't really hear you very clearly. Internet uh, installation. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, our service is um, we receive and in uh, we are receiving equipment and installation of satellite of broadband and we are a branch of foreign company most of our funds are coming from um, our parent company which is in us so do we need to do this esr as well okay uh, my question is all the services that you do um are they um instructed and contracted by your foreign company? You said they primarily fund you. So do you perform yes. all this on their direction and they pay you um, probably cost plus markup for the services? Yeah. Okay, um, services to a foreign connected person uh, is a considered a service center business. Um, it comes under the heading distribution and service center. Service center, um, the definition of what qualifies simply says any service to a foreign connected person. So since you're doing these services yeah. for your parent company, I would say that yes, you do do a relevant activity. Okay, thank you, for, thank you so much. Okay, thank you for the, the question there. And uh, thank you for everybody who asked questions this afternoon. I think we've we've come to the end now. Um, sorry we couldn't answer everybody's question, but we got through quite a bit there and some some very interesting um, questions, some topics to discuss. There is lots to discuss here. Um, but um, thank you to everybody for joining. And um, Chris, did you want to make any last comments before we finish off? I think only only to say thank you very much for all of those who have, who have attended. I thought that was a very good uh, session and obviously it goes without saying that should uh, either ourselves or indeed BDO be of any further assistance to you with any questions regarding this then do feel free to reach out. Um, our contact details are with the slides. Um, you know, as I was saying earlier on then I, 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 I think that this is an incredibly important area that, that people are going to have to get right. Um, I think that there is a reasonable amount of misinformation in the market and misunderstanding in the market. Um, and I think that it's something which, you know, for a lot of businesses, then it's it's not just going to be a question of dealing with the notification, but also dealing with some significant follow up, uh, particularly on the corporate governance side, because I can well imagine that there are probably a number of you that are, are, are certainly thinking, uh, when do we last have a board meeting? <laughs> Or, or what, what, what has our general manager been doing, uh, 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 and, and so on and so forth, particularly in terms of their uh, relationships with, uh, with, 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 foreign, uh, with foreign companies, um, whether they be subsidiaries or branches or, or whatever. So thank you so much for everybody participating. A big thank you also to our speakers. Um, I thought that was, that was brilliant. And um, I hope you all have a good day ahead. And do please feel free to reach out with any questions to any of us. Many thanks. Thanks, Chris, and thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you very much.